everyone, I'm Kevin, otherwise known as Forum BX257, here to bring you another 1980s G.I. Joe tour review. And today I'm going to be taking a look at Cobra's ground attack jet, the 1984 Rattler, and its pilot, Wild Weasel. Now the Rattler makes its first comic book appearance in the old Marvel comic run of G.I. Joe, in issue number 22, where it was called the Tank Smasher. But it wasn't until issue 24 that we get to meet Wild Weasel. In cartoon form, oddly enough, we get to see some prototype Rattlers in the Sunbow Animated 1983 five-part miniseries in Part 4. We don't get to see the Rattler in its proper standard form until the 1984 Sunbow five-part miniseries The Revenge of Cobra in Part 3. We don't get to see Wild Weasel himself until the 1985 episode titled Cobra Sound Waves. The Rattler is 16 inches long by about 17 inches wide. And while in the photographs and in the videos it doesn't look really that small, it is actually a much smaller vehicle than let's say the 1983 Sky Striker jet, which a lot of collectors, myself included, often compare it to. But that's not really a very fair comparison because the Sky Striker was a more expensive vehicle at its time. As a matter of fact, the price point for the Rattler was more in line with the 1983 Dragonfly helicopter. One of the reasons for that, unfortunately, was because Hasbro didn't really have a lot of confidence in the G.I. Joe line in the first few years of its existence, and of course didn't want to spend too much on a big bad guy vehicle, especially if it might not sell, which is one of the reasons why you get a 1982 cardboard Cobra playset, 1983 undersized his tank, and of course a vehicle like this, which is slightly, I would say slightly undersized from what it really should be. And while to me, in displays and of course in the hand playing around with it, it's a perfect size, not too big, not too small. Unfortunately, because of its slightly shrunk proportions in my opinion, the figures in the cockpits are a little bit of a tight squeeze. The canopy opens in a very unusual fashion, with only half the glass coming out. And there is some detail in there. Behind that is the rear gunner's canopy. The turret itself can rotate all the way around, and the guns can move up and down. They're stubby little guns. And of course the clear canopy could open to fit a gunner in there. There is one unfortunate problem with this. As you can see the gunner only faces one way. The chair that the gunner is sitting in does not turn around at the same time as the whole turret does. So you have this going on. Under the nose of the Rattler we have a big Gatling cannon. with a little thumb wheel here, so you can turn the uh, Gatling cannon around and pretend that it's spinning as it fires. I must apologize for this goof, as this is something I only caught at the end of the video while editing this, but the cowlings on the engines, I have them placed on backwards. They really should look like this, with the angled end towards the thruster and the more straight ed edge end towards the intakes. The Rattler is a three-engine vehicle, but only on the front two engines can you remove the cowling tops to reveal jet engine detail. Underneath the Rattler is a whopping 14 missiles and bombs. Starting from the wingtip going in, we have these three bombs on their own separate cradle. So we can just remove that and take a look at these separately. The bombs are meant to be attached to the cradle in this orientation, but as you can see, you can actually put them the other way around. It's just that the fins kind of bump into the edges of the cradle. Next we have a pair of missiles both with the same sculpt. I 
on a large bomb. And one large two-piece missile. The large two-piece missile is kind of strange because as you can see, you can pull it apart rel relatively easily, but I don't think it was meant to be a two-stage missile because the uh, connector point here is actually a keyed sculpted peg here. While we're on the bottom of the Rattler, you can see that it has some landing gear, which just fold in manually like this. plastic for the wheels is a bit pliable, but it's not rubbery. And I love the detail. It actually says Cobra Vito on it, which of course gives away the secret of the Rattler. The secret, of course, being that the wings with the front engines pivot completely upwards. There's a metal bar connecting the two, so you don't have to worry about this breaking anytime soon. There's a little tab on the fuselage which prevents the wings from swinging the other way around. As you can see, this is the official loadout of the missiles and bombs according to the instructions, but because they all have the same peg and hole system, you can place them wherever you want. And last but not least is one of my favorite play features for the Rattler, and that is battle damage panels. Normally when you have battle damage panels on a vehicle, it's usually the whole series of vehicles which have this type of gimmick. And it's kind of easy to forget that the Rattler even has this, which is rather unfortunate. I don't think that many G.I. Joe vehicles actually had anything like this. The only thing that comes to mind is the pop-off panels on the 1991 Brawler tank. The first swappable panel replaces the left side underneath the pilot's canopy. And there is some engine detail underneath that. And the other panel replaces on the right side near the tail section. Again, plenty of engine detail on the inside. The Rattler has one minor and one major breakage issue. The major issue is the landing gear. The point which it kind of locks into place, if you just pull this thing down, it sort of locks into place with these two uh, little grippers right there. And that is overly tight. You have to understand, mine is almost a mint example built when I was an adult. So I wasn't really playing around with this and it still has a lot of stress right there. So that, that's really more of a design flaw than anything. The front wheel is especially prone to braking because not only the uh, things that I mentioned, but almost universally, the little two grippers which lock the wheel into place in its open position are almost always too tight. So swinging it back and forth will eventually just break this thing completely off. The minor issue is rather unusual because I find that some people have said that this is an issue and some people haven't. So I'm thinking that maybe mine is like an early example where the gun is slightly warped or the internal portion in here um, has like flashing or something that, that's kind of warped because it really doesn't rotate all the way around very evenly. And sometimes the whole front end just kind of snaps off. The Cobra Rattler actually starts a trend by having an individual special Cobra symbol. I'm kind of glad that Hasbro didn't do this too often on figures and on vehicles. In this case, it indicates the Cobra Airborne insignia, which is actually rather strange because Cobra has had numerous airplanes, and yet the only other time they've ever seen this is on the 1989 Cobra Fang Mark II. A small helicopter. Since the Rattler already came with its own pilot figure with Wild Weasel, it becomes a question as to who you want to display in the rear gunner's seat. And while you don't necessarily need another pilot, 
the comic books did establish that some certain versions of the Rattler actually had pilot controls, at least backup pilot controls, in the gunner's seat. So you could display an AVAC pilot from the Firebat, who actually did show up piloting Rattlers in the cartoon. However, I have a different idea. My idea is this really cheap custom that I made from a 2004 comic book 3 pack. Now this is the leftovers from when I made my custom Cobra Agent Layla figure. And one of the reasons why I want to use him, not only because, well, he's just leftover parts and he's not going to be used for, in any other fashion, you can see that he has that red scarf over his face, just like the artwork shown on the box. Over nine years ago, when I did my first version of the 1984 Rattler review, I compared it to the Terminator A-10 Warthog, which was a relatively new toy at the time. It was incredibly undersized, considering that it too was meant for a three and three quarter inch figure. So I'm really not going to complain about the size of the Rattler anymore. And here's the comparison that you've all been waiting for, the 1984 Rattler versus the 1983 Sky Striker Jet. And you can see the Sky Striker is noticeably larger, 23 inches long in fact would be almost as wide if I'd extended the wings. This doesn't really look like a very fair matchup, well I mean not toy wise because well that would have been a $15 toy at retail versus a $20 plus dollar toy at retail for this back in its day. And they would have crossed, or crossed over on the shelves. This would have been, even though it's a 1983 vehicle, it would have been re-released in 1984 and 85. Uh, it would have been 84 and 85 on the shelves as well. So they would have been side by side. But if you just go by the characteristics of the airplanes themselves, that's a ground attack vehicle. And this is more of a carrier launched fighter. So I don't really see them as a very good matchup. But in the comic books and in the cartoons, they went up against each other. Even though this thing is a supersonic jet, the slower Rattler actually matched it by using its VTOL creatively. While the Rattler has a lot of air-to-air -air combat capabilities, it's easy to forget that its main purpose was to be a ground attack fighter, basically a bomber. So its true opposite number really should be the 1989 G.I. Joe Mud Fighter, a small bomber. One Cobra aircraft that the Rattler is often compared to is the 1986 Firebat. But as you can see, the Firebat is a really small dogfighter of a craft. The only uh, similarity is, of course, the vertical takeoff and landing feature. But even that is kind of different in that the Firebat takes off and lands completely vertically. And the Rattler's true replacement was the 1990 Cobra Hurricane VTOL, which, just like the Rattler, rotated up its wings along with the engines for that vertical takeoff and landing. While the Rattler is no longer in my top 10 list of favorite G.I. Joe vehicles, it is still really high up there. It's because of just how many great features it has as a toy, even if it doesn't accomplish those things because of some fragility issues and just how visible it is in all sorts of G.I. Joe media. But on top of that, as a lot of collectors will attest, it's because of the overall design of the toy, which really connects with people. It is, of course, based on the A-10. The Rattler is a heavily modified Republic A-10 Warthog, or it used to be known as the Warthog simply because the pilots who first saw it during the late 60s and early 70s thought it looked really ugly. As you can see, there are numerous differences between the Rattler and the A-10, such as the A-10 only has two engines, it doesn't have the mid-fuselage gunnery turret, it doesn't have a VTOL feature, and the Gatling gun on the A-10 runs the entire length of the fuselage. Basically, it's a machine gun with an aircraft wrapped around it. And yet, despite all of these numerous and extreme modifications to the designs, you can clearly see the A-10 in the Rattler. Before I talk about the figure, I'd just like to say one thing about his file card, particularly this typo right here, where it says Bus Wars, it should really say Bush Wars. That's just the general uh, conflict that they dubbed this thing, when a lot of these ex-military pilots would engage in smuggling things like drugs and weapons and conflict diamonds and things like that in the 70s. 
As for the figure himself, he doesn't come with any weapons or accessories, which is rather a shame because he actually looks pretty good if you put the 1986 AVAX black parachute pack harness on him. Looking at the details of Wild Weasel's outfit, he's actually rather practically dressed. He has an outlandish all over red, but it's really not that much different than let's say the 1983 His Tank driver, who was all over red with touches of black and a bit of blue just for a pop of color. In Wild Weasel's case, it's his aviation scarf, which is rather nice. He also has a silver Cobra emblem on his arm there. A long time ago, I used to consider the silver emblem to be a sign of being an officer within the Cobra ranks, but it seems to be applied rather just haphazardly. One interesting thing about the figure is just how large his head looks. Now, granted, this is supposed to be a helmet, but sometimes the helmet is rather small, and just more compact to the head, whereas this thing seems a bit more, well, realistic in just how big and bulky it can be. In this case, he has these weird little things on the side here, and he has like a little bone dome. Unfortunately, the sculpting in my particular example is a little bit soft, so you can't see the distinction between that front portion and the rest of the helmet. But this bone dome portion is where the uh, visor would slide up into. I kind of wish this was uh, like a different color. Maybe they could have made the bone dome black and his actual visor silver or something just to distinguish it. I think that with more paint work on his helmet, you would kind of see why it's so large and bulky compared to the rest of his body. But like I said, what's actually on him is very practical stuff like harness belts and big pouches. He has his to-do list there and a map of his targets. One very interesting thing about the figure sculpt, however, are the zipper pulls on the bottoms of his legs. Like normally you would see like zippers sculpted onto figures, but the actual zipper pulls down here by his boots just kind of pop out a little bit. It's really interesting that they actually went and did the paint mask right around it, just so that you can actually see it. One thing that's always bothered me about some of the 1984 figures which came out, which are individual characters, is just how underdeveloped some of them are. And unfortunately, Wild Weasel is one of them. One of the comic books which actually focused on him actually made him out to be a very interesting character, and yet it's never followed up, despite the immense use of the Rattler jet within the comic books and the cartoons. Other characters like Copperhead and Scrap Iron just get the boot, and yet Firefly gets this really weird and complicated backstory later on. However, there is one silver lining to his being slightly generic, and that is you can use him as an army builder very easily. There really isn't any distinctive portion on him which just speaks of individuality. You can't remove his helmet, you can't see any bit of skin, and there aren't any other patches other than the Cobra symbol. In fact, in one issue of the comic books, you can see several Air Vipers actually wearing the generic Wall Weasel outfit. So just who replaces Wild Weasel in Cobra Command's Air Force? Well, if you consider him to be an elite pilot, the 1986 AVAX do. However, if you consider him more of a ground attack bomber pilot, the 1989 Aero Vipers do. As for Wild Weasel's opposite number on the G.I. Joe side, if you consider him to be an elite pilot, then his opposite number should be the 1983 Ace figure. But again, if you consider him to be more of a ground attack bomber pilot, then the 1989 Dogfight would be his opposite number. Apparently, this version of Wild Weasel has an error and a variant. However, I wasn't able to find very good photographs online of these examples, so you might have to take this with a grain of salt. But on some versions, the map is sort of flipped, so that might be the error. And the date code on the inner leg of this, well, the same leg, instead of reading 1984, has 1988 
as maybe some later versions of the figures were uh, made using the molds of the Tiger Force figure from 1988. Again, I really haven't found any online evidence of this, but some people have been saying this on forums, so it might be true. It might be something that you want to look out for if you're interested in variations. In India, under the Fun School brand, they released a wild weasel on an individual card in the early 2000s, and it came with a working Cobra parachute. I'm not really sure why Hasbro never did this themselves, but man, is it a really cool accessory. If you're looking for an original 1984 Rattler on the aftermarket, I'm sorry to say that it's a very expensive proposition. Not only due to its rarity, due to the breakages of the landing gear and the nose can, as I said before, but because of all the small parts, it has 14 bobs and missiles, the bomb cradles, the engine cowlings, and of course the um, panels, two of which do not store on the vehicle, of course. So some sellers actually consider the bow bell damage panels to be bonuses and I can understand why some collector buyers kind of agree with that and sort of wave them off because they would rather at least have the clean panels for display. But on top of all of this it's an iconic Cobra vehicle based on a much beloved real world military aircraft. One odd thing is, despite how expensive this thing can get on the aftermarket, Wild well Weasel himself, the original 1984 figure, is actually a fairly common figure to find on the aftermarket and is really dirt cheap. And one of the reasons why I want to mention that is because you can swap him out with the 25th anniversary Wild well Weasel, which came with the 25th anniversary reissue of the Rattler, which is something that which I highly recommend. which is a very odd thing because even the 25th anniversary version of this is actually gone up in value on the aftermarket. And while it has all of the same parts and features, the missiles are a little bit rounded on, on the uh, 25th anniversary version. And I think the, um, the actual plastic is a bit purplish rather than blue, but it still looks really good and still is a very good complement and like I said, it's an iconic Cobra vehicle, which you really should have in your collection. Some detail in there. Cobra replaced them with a generic Air Viper, the Air Vac. 
Well, that's all the time I have right now. Please check out my Facebook page for more information and behind the scenes photos for these reviews. Thank you for watching this video and stay tuned for next time to see another 1980s G.I. Joe tour review. See you then.